So take it away, Abby. All right. Thank you very much. What a great gee afternoon it's been. I, I've really enjoyed this. And, uh, um, and I don't mind at all going last. It's kept me uh, on my toes. Um, okay, so I'm Abby Reimer of the Applied Physics Laboratory, and I'm the proud principal investigator of the proposal concept study for a mission to the Neptune Triton system. It's a mission that we named Odyssey, uh, and we enjoyed coming up with the name and coming up with our logo. And I did hear it said rather glibly at a meeting that the one thing you can guarantee is if you name a mission at this phase, that if that's not the name it would go forward with, and that's fine too. We don't want to deny anyone the fun of naming their mission. Um, I've been ably supported in this mission by project scientist Kirby Runyon, and very much my right-hand man, and has kept me sane through the process so far. So a big shout out to him, as well as Brenda Clyde, who's the lead engineer at APL, uh, leading the, engin the engineering study. We just had our ACE run two weeks ago, so a lot of this is quite hot off the press in that regard. But we've been working on this since uh, really last summer. We did quite a lot of pre-proposal work, and then the proposal started properly off in October last year. We've got about 50 uh, co-eyes and uh, a large science team working with us, um, as uh, befits such a, a large mission and an interesting target. Um, we have also incorporated a sociologist uh, that some of you might know from the Cassini era, and she's working also with Europa Clipper, is uh, Janet Battisi from Princeton. Um, so we had her um, roped in from the very start to try and deliberately design uh, a multi-generational mission, but also a mission with deliberately um, distributed leadership, such that if I had to step away, someone else could easily step in uh, to run meetings, and also so that everyone feels empowered to bring their own versions of management and questions to, uh, to us from every level. So I hope we've been successful in that. We certainly, despite these strange times, we've, uh, we've had a really nice time working together and uh, I think we've been as effective as we could be given the situation. So we split um, our team, or we created working groups within our team um, to cover the different aspects of the Neptune Triton system. So that's uh, Aurora Magnetosphere, Triton, icy satellites and rings, Neptune and exoplanets. So for Triton, we did study a landed element. So I'll just uh, talk about that a little bit now because you'll see we, we haven't gone forward with that in this presentation, in, in this study. Uh, we also had it in our pre-proposal phase and actually we, we, we deliberately didn't put it in our proposal when we proposed it. And one of our only weaknesses, which I was en enormously grateful for, was why hadn't we included a Triton landed element? So I took that weakness as being like carte blanche to add this Triton landed element to our proposed work. So we spent quite a bit of effort um, defining the uh, science that could be done from a, a Triton lander. Uh, Lene Quick was uh, the member of the working group that led that particular effort. We looked at Triton Hopper um, and we looked at a Triton ballistic impactor like the LL cross, um, where you would just have no science instruments on the actual impactor, but the spacecraft would float, fly close enough to look at the plumes. And I think both of those really do um, bear revisiting. But in the sense of this first mission that's already carrying a Neptune atmospheric probe and to minimize the risk to make it the shovel ready concept, which we really intend for it to be, we, we decided not to go forward with that. Um, so what we're producing here, honestly, is if NASA found the money tomorrow, they could start building this project tomorrow. That's, that is our concept. It's a, a shovel ready concept using heritage instruments that we can uh, hand off to NASA and they could just build it right away if they wanted to, but also that's proudly multi-generational so that you'll see that the payload and, and other defining things on, on the mission can always uh, be uh, improved upon as uh, we identify further avenues for uh, investigation for, uh, for the future groups. So here's a picture of some of our team. This was at the happy hour at the end of our science team meeting at the end of March. Good looking bunch of people. And, uh, and I took the opportunity of uh, the fact that this is in Zoom land, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade and all that, uh, to uh, have little vignettes of uh, members of the team that you're going to hear from during the course of the next 30 minutes or so. And I felt that that was appropriate for a mission like this, which has got so many different voices involved in it. And also to be, I don't know, to be modern and kind of... Uh, experiment with new ways of doing things, which I also think is, uh, is quite appropriate given our mission and, and the people involved in the way that they think. And I'll uh, just emphasize that this is the Neptune Triton mission, as my friend and colleague Carol Patty put it, a flagship for everyone. So looking back at the, uh, the uh, ice giants in the planetary decade or survey historically, 
So ice giants are the only class of solar system planet not yet to have a dedicated orbital mission. So as such, they have been studied quite a lot already, uh, and they were the top and only priority for a new flagship mission in the last planetary decade or survey. Now, the specification and in that one bullet is that it's for a Uranus orbiter and probe, which would be terrific. Um, but if you read the actual chapter, the verbiage in the actual chapter, they don't, um, they talk very generally about the excellent science that could be done at either of the systems and, and emphasize that the two systems offered equally rich science return. Um, they note that the Uranus mission is preferred for that decade, really because of uh, the trajectory difficulties in getting to Neptune and the availability of favorable Uranus trajectories in the coming decade. So I'm going to hand over first to uh, my dear colleague, Candy Hansen, to talk to you a bit about how our understanding of the Neptune system has changed and how that's led us to alter our plans, or at least to make sure we include comprehensive plans for Neptune and available in the next planetary decade or so. My name is Candy Hansen. I've worked on a number of of missions over the course of my career. My first was Voyager, and I see my role on Odyssey as the Voyager veteran, the corporate memory. I worked with the Voyager imaging team through all of the flybys, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Voyager has been our first and so far only mission to Neptune. We flew by in 1989, and with Voyager, we discovered amazing storms in Neptune's atmosphere. A tilted and offset magnetosphere, ring arcs, and an incredibly unique moon, Triton. Is Triton an ocean world? Voyager passed Triton at a distance of almost 40,000 kilometers. And what we found was a moon unlike any others that we had seen in our solar system. The sparsely cratered surface shows evidence for recent, geologically recent resurfacing. Most of the moons we flew by were covered with craters, not this one. Triton has a tenuous nitrogen atmosphere and surface ices that respond to the seasons by moving around and forming polar caps, we think. It was extreme southern summer at the time, southern spring at the time of the Voyager flyby. And you can see from the plot on the left that the latitude of the subsolar point varies dramatically. And we flew by at an extreme time of the year with most of the northern hemisphere in polar night. The most astounding thing of all, though, was our discovery that there were four active plumes on this body with a surface temperature of 38 Kelvin. We found eruptions, eight kilometers high. And we found on the surface fans deposited on the surface, which are presumably from no longer active plumes, and uh, only in the southern hemisphere. Of course, we couldn't see in the northern hemisphere because it was not. That immediately, immediately brought up the question, are the plumes driven by solar energy, like Mars, the seasonal jets on Mars, or are they endogenic, more like Enceladus? What volatile reservoir are they sampling? That is a mystery for Odyssey to solve. Perfect. Thank you very much, Candy. And uh, I think probably for some of you, that might be the first time you've seen that image taken by Voyager during the Triton flyby. It's remarkable how, uh, how great of an image it took to say it wasn't even a, a planned flyby. So uh, Candy's talked to us a little bit about uh, what we've learned since the last planetary decadal survey that's led us to revisit the, uh, the nature of Triton as a, an ocean world. Um, and it's also been, uh, as, a, as a consequence, it's uh, captured in the OPAG, the As Planets Assessment Group uh, living document, as, uh, as noting that the uh, favoured ice giant in the terms of, uh, I guess, the bang for the book as planetary science would be Neptune over Uranus because of the additional existence of this uh, dwarf planet. I mean, really, a, 
a binary system in a peculiar sense of, uh, of an ice giant, which is uh, the unique planet in our solar system we haven't visited yet, plus uh, a dwarf planet, actually slightly larger than Pluto. And as we know from the recent or relatively recent New Horizons flyby, we learned such a lot about Pluto and it really captured humanity's is, is imagination uh, as we did that flyby. Um, and this a mission such as this will be doing a New Horizons quality flyby on the order of every month. So to talk a bit more about that um, is uh, our colleague and, uh, and Kawhi Alan Stern. I'm Alan Stern from the Neptune Odyssey team. And a really spectacular thing about Neptune is Triton, its largest satellite, orbiting in a retrograde orbit. It's the hallmark of a capture from heliocentric orbit and formation, not in the Neptune system, but in the outer solar system itself. Our best paradigm for the origin of Triton is that it was once a dwarf planet of the Kuiper Belt. At the time of the Voyager flyby, when Triton was first explored, the dwarf planets of the Kuiper Belt were not known, or at least not recognized as a population, because there was only Pluto. But today, you know many of them, from Pluto and Eris to Haumea, Makimaki and Orcus. And this population is really spectacular. Like the terrestrial planets, they show a tremendous degree of diversity, from a wide range of albedos to a wide range of bulk densities, to a wide range of satellite complements, some, some with atmospheres, some without. They also show a wide range of surface composition. Together, this ensemble begs for more exploration. And the first taste of that exploration came in 2015 when New Horizons showed what a spectacular world Pluto is, and which, by extension, taught us that the dwarf planets can be just spectacular teachers about geology, geophysics, geochemistry, origins, and atmospheres for this entire population, which hadn't been recognized until really the 1990s and the early 2000s. And, our solar system. and Voyager's exploration of Triton showed it was amazing too. From its active geysers on the surface, fascinating fossil transport, and a rich nitrogen atmosphere, Triton really is one of the most spectacular worlds of the outer solar system. The Voyager's instruments were very primitive compared to the instruments we can build with like today. In fact, primitive even compared to the instruments that New Horizons flew um, to explore Pluto. From everything that we know about Triton, bringing the modern suite of instruments to bear will teach us volumes about Triton as a body and by extension, the comparative planetology of comparative planets. And if that weren't enough, Triton, like Pluto, and so many other worlds of the outer solar system, is thought to be an ocean world. This combination is almost irresistible. And Neptune Odyssey offers to explore Triton in even more detail than New Horizons explored Pluto. In doing so, Neptune Odyssey will make a giant leap forward for the comparative planetology of dwarf planets and for understanding Triton's origin and evolution in ways we simply cannot without a Neptune system over there. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Alan. Perfect. So moving on from that, we'll have uh, short presentations from uh, different of the working group leads. Um, and because we've only got 30 minutes and a lot of ground to cover, I'll, I'll, we'll launch straight into it. So starting with the, the outermost edges of the Neptune system, we have the uh, working group lead of Aurora Magnetospheres, Ian Cohen. I'm getting a little message from Ring Central, but I think it's fine, so I'll just continue. So interrupt me if any if there's a problem. All right. So. I'm Ian Cohen from the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, and I was co-chair of the Aurora Magnetospheres Working Group for the Odyssey Concept Study. Neptune is an extremely compelling science target from a magnetospheres and space physics perspective for several reasons. First, the planet itself has a non-dipolar magnetic field with a high offset from its rotational axis. Together, these create a highly structured and incredibly complex field topology that varies drastically with regards to the solar wind as the planet rotates every 16 hours. Second, Perhaps most intriguingly, Neptune's magnetosphere has Triton, 
the tightly active captured Kuiper belt object. We have no idea how the capture of a foreign body like Triton, which may be actively spewing particles into the system, affects a planet's magnetosphere. This gives rise to a host of outstanding questions, including if Triton is adding material through geysers, how does the Neptune system shed that mass? How is plasma sourced and transported in the system's complex magnetic topology? How would any potential world footprint from Triton behave? And finally, does Triton limit the relatively weak radiation belts that Voyager 2 observed at Neptune? Or does Neptune's complex magnetosphere make it impossible to sustain robust radiation belts at all? All of these mysteries and more remain unanswered for Neptune. And the only way to address them is with a dedicated orbiter, like Odyssey, complemented with comprehensive particles and fields instrumentation. Perfect. Thank you, Ian. And, uh, and as Ian says there, the uh, complicated magnetic field ge geometry due to the multipolar field is uh, something that even in that beautiful and really complicated looking model that you can see running, it probably doesn't really capture quite how complicated that system is going to be. And we can only study magnetic fields by studying them in situ. It's one of those measurements that you simply cannot make, however good your telescope, from a distance. So we can never hope to get measurements of Neptune's magnetic field from Earth. We have to go into orbit to get those. Um, I'll also note when uh, um, we talked about the Triton atmosphere being mostly nitrogen, that's very similar to Titan at Saturn. And before we arrived at Saturn, we assumed that the entire Saturn's magnetosphere was going to be full of particles from Titan. So it should be full of uh, nitrogen and also a bit of methane. And uh, when we got there, in fact, we found that not to be the case at all. And in fact, Saturn's magnetosphere was full of oxygen particles and water group particles, all of which were sourced from vol volcanic, cryovolcanic activity at the South Pole of its tiny snowball of a moon, Enceladus, which is right in really close to the planet and that we'd never imagined was a significant source of plasma to Saturn. Perhaps because Triton is a little bit closer to Neptune than Titan is to Saturn, that Neptune's magnetosphere really will be full of particles from Triton's uh, exosphere. Um, but I suspect there's going to be a lot of surprises both there and, uh, and in other places when we finally do go and visit and spend years in situ understanding the system, just like Cassini did at Saturn. So to talk a bit more about the geophysics at uh, Triton is our uh, project scientist and geophysicist, Kobe Lennon. Hi, I'm Kirby Runyon, project scientist and science team member on the Triton Working Group. Triton's geologic diversity is striking, with double ridges that are reminiscent of similar features on Europa. There's also evidence of recent cryovolcanism in smooth plains that embay higher topography. There's a general paucity of impact craters across the surface, suggesting, in conjunction with the cryovolcanism, a youthful surface. There's a low variance in topography across the entire moon, and there's also sublimation-driven landforms and cliffs and hill faces that probably uh, change in shape and size with Triton seasons. Of course, Candy talked about the plumes, but we also don't know if they're in the northern hemisphere, and Odyssey will be able to start getting at that. Altogether, Triton is an enticing geologic wonderland, showing us what happens when a dwarf planet from the Kuiper Belt gets tidally reactivated by a giant planet. Thank you. Perfect. And to put the uh, discovery of the plumes and, uh, and how we came to understand that despite it being 30 years since Voyager visited Triton, our, uh, our appreciation of, of how oceans can exist on other planets uh, and just to give us a bit more background information is uh, Candy Hansen up again. Triton has continued to be the source of research in the years since Voyager careful crater counts with more recent statistics were carried out by Schenk and Zahnmann in 2007. And they were able to estimate that Triton's surface age may be less than 10 million years old, which is day before yesterday in geologic time. And it couldn't be that capture. It has to be something going on recently. The answer to that question came with research done, carried out by Nimmo and Spencer in 2015, where they realized that obliquity tides could supply the necessary energy for surface processes and near surface processes that would erase craters. If you had a convecting ice shelf, say 100 to 300 kilometers thick, that could actually result in a layer warm enough for liquid ammonia water 
And this caused us to rethink the um, energetic possibility for the source of the plumes. But more than that, it made us realize that Triton could belong to the family of ocean worlds, ocean worlds with plumes. Great, thank you. This is uh, a nice image that was uh, published in New Scientist a few years ago. Neptune's moons were normal until Triton came crashing in. So one of the things I, I sometimes say, but I know as a, a, a mere plasma physicist, is it, is it necessarily, uh, or maybe an oversimplification of the nature of the ice giants in our system, but between Uranus and Neptune, both of them are equally compelling science targets. But the difference really to my simple mind is that Uranus has suffered some tumultuous past that's caused it to be tipped on its axis and, uh, and Neptune hasn't. So in the sense of the planet itself, Neptune maybe arguably represents a more pristine ice giant, but Uranus's moon system has not been disrupted by something like Triton crashing into it. And so the, the moon system at Uranus is a relatively pristine example, potentially of an ice giant moon system. But then of course we have uh, Triton and Triton dwarf planet captured at the edge of the, the system at, at, at Neptune, completely changed everything. But also gives us an opportunity to look at a moon and ring system that has been disrupted. Because there are rings, there's famously like three ring arcs still left and small icy satellites. And uh, I'll hand over to uh, one of the working group leads, uh, Tracy Becker, to talk to us a bit more about that. Hi, I'm Tracy Becker from the Southwest Research Institute and co-chair for the Rings and Small Satellites Working Group for the Neptune Odyssey Mission Concept Study. Whenever we study the interaction between rings and moons, we are exploring the physics of planetary disks. This has applications for understanding the formation and evolution of our own solar system and those forming around distant stars. The Neptunian ring moon system is very different from the Saturnian ring moon system, and we want to understand why. Why is the Neptunian ring moon system so bizarre? We want to know how did this complex ring moon system form? Is it primordial, or did it form more recently from a disruption? And how did the capture of Triton impact this ring moon system? The dynamic Neptunian ring moon system is still active. We observe incomplete rings, known as ring arcs, that are changing on the time scales of at least years, and we've even seen some of them disappear. How are these rings and ring arcs combined? How do they evolve and change with time? There is still so much left to uncover in this complicated system. We are still discovering Neptune satellites. Where are the source bodies that maintain these rings and ring arcs? And what are the rings and satellites made of? Are they linked to the Kuiper Belt? All right, thank you. And uh, moving on, maybe inwards, uh, we'll talk a bit about Neptune itself. So uh, like I said, this uh, builds on several previous uh, studies, which have studied Uranus and, and, and Neptune, the planets themselves as, uh, as ice giants, the only planetary type in our solar system not to have had a dedicated orbital probe to date. And also those with a very complicated multipolar magnetic field geometry, which I do think humanity and our understanding of science and our ability to model as this displayed here is, uh, is getting to the point that we can get our heads around this. So it's maybe fortunate that they put perhaps the most complicated planets right at the edge. So I'll hand over to uh, Amy Simon, member of the uh, Neptune Working Group, to talk a bit more about Neptune, the planet. Hi, I'm Amy Simon from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and I'm a member of the Neptune Atmospheres and Interiors Working Group. There's several key reasons why studying Neptune is so important. First, we want to understand how the ice giants formed. It's difficult to fit them into existing formation models, forming at the right time and place to reach their current masses and composition. We need in situ measurements of the noble gases and elemental abundances to know when, where, and how they formed. We also don't know much about their interior structure if there's distinct layering, mixed interior, or if Neptune even has a core at all. Neptune's energy balance is much different than Uranus's, as a consequence of its formation, evolution, and the unknown deep interior structure. The h are also a laboratory for understanding atmospheric dynamics. They're quite different than Jupiter and Saturn, with a higher proportion of ices, and they may experience an ambient convection. And even with little sunlight and frigid temperatures, Hi, I'm Amy Simon from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. I'm a member of the Neptune Atmospheres and Interiors Working Group. 
There's several key reasons why studying Neptune is so important. First, we want to understand how the ice giants formed. It's difficult to fit them into existing formation models, forming at the right time and place to reach their current masses and composition. We need institutional nutrients and elemental gases and elemental abundances to know when, where, and how they formed. We also don't know much about their interior structure. If there's distinct layering, mixed interior, or if Neptune even has a core at all. Neptune's energy balance is much different than Uranus's as a consequence of its formation, evolution, and the unknown deep interior structure. The h are also a laboratory for understanding atmospheric dynamics. They're quite different than Jupiter and Saturn, with a higher proportion of ices, and they may experience inhibited convection. And even with little sunlight and frigid temperatures, there may be a seasonal component to the clouds and hazes. By studying the giant storms that form amid high-speed winds, we get clues to the deeper circulation. We also think that Neptune has an ionic ocean. Is that where its complex magnetic field is generated? Beyond understanding our own solar system, Neptune holds important information about exoplanets. A large majority of exoplanets fall in the same mass range as our own ice giants. Understanding how our own ice giants formed and evolved will be key to interpreting these planets around other stars. Thanks, Amy. And I'm sorry I made the mistake of checking the chat. I didn't realize it would make the audio restart. I have another five minutes. Casey, is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. All right. So uh, as I said at the start, we uh, named the, the mission Odyssey, Neptune Odyssey. Um, I'm trying to remember to always say Neptune Odyssey rather than Mars not Odyssey to, to make sure we don't get too confused. And we're taken to referring to the spacecraft as ODI. Um, when we wrote our proposal, we stressed the need for a shovel-ready concept, not just because it was, uh, I thought it was appropriate to provide such a thing to the Decadal Survey for a mission that's been so comprehensively studied in the past, and the JPL study was only two years ago. Um, and, but also because uh, the need for Jupiter fly, but we thought there was going to be a need for, definitely need for Jupiter flyby, and the, the Jupiter flyby window to enable a uh, a mission to the Neptune system closes at something like 2031. Um, actually, and, and we also need nuclear power, so this is a, an important element we need to keep pressure on NASA uh, and, and, and our nation to uh, keep on track with the planned production of plutonium and, and our mission, as you'll see, would, would actually require even a little bit more. But early on, I decided that um, the need for a Jupiter flyby was too risky given the time frame. So although as long as we can get off the ground before like 2031, 2032, we can uh, use a Jupiter flyby, I wanted to make sure we provided a mission alternative that didn't require one. And you'll see that if you build the mission as we've designed it, you can easily, and you happen to get ready and you set out the launch bar in 2028, then all power to you, you can do, you can send a lot more mass or crucially, and most likely you'd lose the upper stage, which we've defined and included here. All right, so our, our spacecraft's actually been redesigned from uh, the version you see here, but just so you can see, we have something that looks quite familiar to you, and actually it's gonna look even more familiar to you in the final report, because the high gain antenna is gonna get moved to the top. This is the high gain antenna on the side here. This is our atmospheric probe. These are gonna be switched around, so it's gonna look a lot like the Cassini-Huygens combination. The high gain antenna is gonna grow a little bit to be a four meter diameter, and that's actually gonna define the diameter of the, of, of this aspect of the diameter here, which is uh, where you can see it'll fit in the fairing of the SLS very comfortably. It'll be more like four meters across here, which means it'll fit in the fairing of other launch vehicles quite easily. And crucially, we're losing one of these, are the RTGs, the green things around the bottom, we're gonna lose one of those so that we, we, we realize that we can do the mission with uh, three RTGs um, at, the, at, the very, at the very most. So those are the two major changes that came out from our ACE run and that the engineering team are working to reflect as we speak. We've made uh, comprehensive uh, instrument packages for the orbiter and the probe. Um, so a lot of these will also be familiar to you, because why not base it on the best? A lot of these uh, are featured on the Cassini spacecraft and also on the uh, Juno spacecraft, currently in operation at Jupiter. So we've got cameras, an around angle camera, or UV imager, uh, VIS-IR, visible and infrared imager and an infrared mapping radiometer. We've got an ion neutral mass spectrometer, so for in situ particles and electron and uh, ion plasma measurements, energetic particles, so going up to hopefully into the low MeV range, 
and an ENA imager, which was used to enormous advantage by Cassini when Cassini was in the solar wind, but didn't start getting used for heliophysics measurements until after Cassini had passed Jupiter. So this is one of the interdisciplinary elements of this mission. I hope that we can explore in more detail as we go forward is having instruments like this turned on in the solar wind to make measurements of the edge of the heliosphere, just like Cassini did, and actually could give you that stereo point of view, looking with the, the Odyssey ENA imager from 30 AU to IMAP ENA imager, which should be flying by then at 1 AU. Really unique perspective on, on our heliosphere. We have a laser altimeter, which uh, I haven't worked with before, but we do have radio plasma waves, which I have worked with a lot and, uh, and a really vital measurement on, uh, on anything like this. We've got a uh, magnetometer, so a familiar magnetometer boom with three mags distributed along a boom, which will be deployed from the spacecraft. We've got microwave radiometer. This is massive. It's massive panels that you put on the side of the spacecraft, and every time and it, and it uses a lot of power too. So every time I look at it, I go like, hmm. There wasn't an MWR on Cassini, and I didn't ever hear anyone like bashing at our door saying we must have MWR measurements. But we've had a few presentations uh, deliberately to, to educate myself and the team on the power of the uh, science from an MWR. But also, Tom Spilker came up with a neat way that you can actually embed the panels inside each other to make the overall instrument just a bit smaller. So we still we still have that on our on our payload, and uh, we're. Yeah, this, we're defining the science from all of these investigations. Many of these do double duty as well, so it's quite a challenge to uh, compare and, and collate all the science from the different working groups. Each working group came up with its own uh, scientific traceability matrix, and we're just now combining them and starting those fun, you know, don't mean this, not fun, discussions of uh, what D-scope options we might um, have to make in order to fit within our, our mass constraints for the various options of uh, trajectory. So we also have dust analyzer and we have ed uh, EPO education public outreach type cameras on both the uh, spacecraft and the probe, which I think are really important. So I'm, gonna, I'm clinging to those, um, although they do have quite a high data rate, especially for the probe version. But how fantastic to have a picture like the orbiter always looking, for example, on the orbiter, always looking at high gain antenna, seeing it weather in the solar wind. And from the probe, watching the probe fall away from the spacecraft, I just, I think those things, we call it public outreach, but it really doesn't capture the inspiration that measurements like that, observations like that provide. And I think flagship missions, I've heard uh, Heidi Hamill said this, for example, at the London meeting this year, they have to be something more than just do great science. They have to inspire and, and, and humanity. They have to be something much, much more. And this sort of mission to the outreaches of the solar system is just, I can't tell you how much fun and exciting it is to be part of planning. So the probe instruments, um, I won't go through these, I know I'm running out of time. It's uh, very similar to what you've seen actually presented to, uh, based on Galileo probes and Cunio Sayanagi, one of our team member has been uh, working to develop comprehensive atmospheric probes for decades. So I'm sure you've seen these at various meetings over the years. Because I want to make sure to cover as comprehensively as I can the uh, launch vehicle decision path and, and how we're getting there and what the options are, because it's rather neat. So we've decided to go with an SLS Block 2 with a kick stage for our point design. This enables annual opportunities that so doesn't require a Jupiter gravity assist. It's all chemical propulsion mission and it provides the slowest arrival speed to Neptune. So we're going in at like one kilometer a second, which is relatively slow compared to the entry velocities that were provided in the JPL study. Um, we have an enabled option, like I said, if we manage to launch early enough that we can use the Jupiter flyby, then we can drop the Centaur kick stage, or we could keep the Centaur kick stage and send a load of mass to orbit, like three more probes, <laughs> it's a ton more. Um, so that would be awesome. I think that, I, I hope that we can organize a mission so that we could launch in like 2030 and send all of the mass that we can possibly send to Neptune using the SLS and uh, upper stage. And I'll note that the uh, JPL study studied SLS with a solar electric propulsion upper stage. So that's our recommended for future study. They find a relatively fast entry speed, but working with them and our tour designers, I think it's something we might be able to accommodate. And SCP, I guess at the start, I didn't understand it as well as I should have done. And it's really not a risky um, technology. It's used all the time on commercial um, satellites and it's been used on the Psyche and the Dawn missions. Um, so it's, you know, pick, pick, your, pick your point design. And uh, we went with the upper stage, but really the SCP would be just as useful and provide just as much extra mass to orbit. So this is a, a neat plot that uh, our trajectory designers came up with. It shows you in the circles, these are Earth-Neptune direct opportunities and the crosses are Earth-Jupiter-Neptune opportunities. 
And on the x-axis is launch year from 2025 to 2038. I'm trying to show you my cursor. The main screen's on the other screen. So you see this, that where the hey, cross Abby, is. This is Casey. I'm sorry to interrupt. You need to try to wrap it up in just a couple minutes. Okay, thanks. I'll finish with this okay. slide. Okay. Um, so we, we're choosing our point design to be the one in 2033 that's direct to Neptune. But you can see if you were able to get to the launch pad in 2030, and like a blue cross is actually only a, launch, a, a, a cruise phase of like less than 10 years. Our point design is a cruise phase of over 15 years. So it's a long time. But hey, all that great stuff you can do in the solar wind. And on the y-axis is the uh, mass to orbit. So this is the, it's not quite the dry mass, it's the dry mass plus the propellant left for the tour, but it's roughly the dry mass. And you can see we're guessing with our point design about three and a half thousand kilograms of uh, mass to orbit, which is a lot, which is great. I'll leave you to ask me about the uh, probe entry because I want to make sure I, I wrap up elegantly. And, uh, and I hope that we've shared with you most of the really great science that we're going to do and uh, our proposal uh, we'll describe in detail how we're going to do it. And uh, like I say, it's, it really is a shovel-ready concept. It could be, you know, pick up and build it tomorrow if, if you wanted to. Uh, we've got about a third of the tour defined. Our, our uh, colleague Juan Arrieta has uh, been working his fingers to the bone because we're not the only PMCS study that he's uh, leading the uh, trajectory design for. The cross divisional opportunities. So since working on the Cassini project, I actually wrote my PhD on Cassini in the solar wind. So I was one of the only people working on Cassini before it got to Saturn. So I think I have a particular interest in this sort of thing. As I noted, it's up to a 16 year cruise phase, um, up to 30 AU. So enormous opportunities for heliophysics to, I really think that doing those IBEX and um, Cassini-like and in the future IMAP type observations at the edge of the heliosphere as we go out, would be, would be a flagship for heliophysics in itself. Also exoplanet observations of the solar system, the opportunity to look back at our pale blue dot, um, like Carl Sagan did and planned for the Voyager uh, mission, has massive implications to astrophysics. Um, and then perhaps, and, and this is something that one's looking at opportunities for in our design, is, is if we could include a, an asteroid or a centaur flyby on the way out and maybe structure these observations in the solar wind in, in, a, in, a, in a smart way so that we start the campaign for looking at the heliosphere and the campaign for looking at Earth. And so each of those uh, can be used to calibrate the instruments and all that sort of stuff that we, we really love to do, but also to do uh, a small mission type science opportunity in itself at the time. So thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. If, you, if you're interested, please get involved. We've got white papers that we're preparing as well as this proposal. And um, they're listed on the OPAG website. They can be ac um, accessed from there. If you've got any ideas as well, one area to have a neat idea to start the Neptune's track list on Spotify. So you can uh, sing along and, uh, and I'll leave it there. And I'm sorry that I overran a little bit, but there was a lot. There's a lot. It is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Casey. Okay. Thank you, Abby. Um, we, we did start a few minutes late, so I'm going to go ahead and have us take maybe one or two questions unless Doris stopped me. Um, so I'm gonna start with this question, um, which is, where is it? If you could briefly tell us what the main science questions that drove your choice of instruments and, and the design. That's a great question. Yeah, I, well, at the moment we, we have a very comprehensive uh, instrument suite. So uh, we designed we had instruments already defined for Neptune, for specifically Neptune study, including uh, quite a comprehensive set of instruments for the probe, because those things have been studied in detail in the past. Fortunately, a lot of those instruments are exactly the same as the instruments you want to use to study Triton itself. But that's the main thing that our proposal is bringing to the table, is this opportunity to study the Neptune Triton system and do real system science. So that has uh, required the re-evaluation of all of the instruments in this more geophysical context. Um, so that hasn't really resulted in a lot being added. Um, and that's good, that's, that's fortunate for us. The uh, allowance of uh, us to use the SLS block two has uh, enabled us to get a lot more mass to orbit. So we then added this MWR instrument, which is a microwave radiometer to study the, uh, the deep subsurface. We, we haven't put on things like the Doppler seismometer, which was on the JPL study. Um, 
and we may revisit that. But the, the, because we were trying to do the system science, that, that the instruments like that didn't quite do so much double duty as some of the other ones. Um, and then the most important suite for us from a non-spinning spacecraft is enabling us to get really good in situ plasma observations. So again, system science, understanding what is the makeup of the entire of the Neptune system, not just the planet itself, requires us to have a comprehensive plasma suite on the spacecraft. And our spacecraft is, uh, they call it three axis stabilized, so it's not spinning. So there's a challenge there. The, the cameras are pointing one way and the in-situ measurements are maybe wanting to go down the ram velocity of the spacecraft. So we've added pivot platforms to enable the, uh, the camera suite to move backwards and forwards, which has all brought extra mass. And then we have to do a cost-benefit analysis of which ones of those get to, to be put forward as our recommendation. And that's really what we're just starting now.